Hudson's Bay Company History. G'day guys, how's it going? My name is Ozzy Tash. This particular video was suggested by two of my Discord members. We're really looking forward to getting to this video. I haven't really learned a lot about Hudson Bay Company, so we're really looking forward to getting to this video and learning about the history of the famous Hudson Bay Company. Let's roll. In the 17th century, the French had what was in fact a monopoly on the Canadian fur trade yes. through their colony, New France. After hearing from the Cree that the country north and west of Lake Superior was the best fur country ever found, two French fur traders, Pierre Espirit Radisson and Medard de Grossier, sought permission to explore the region and establish a trading post of the great frozen sea that, according to the natives, lay still further to the north. Okay. Fearing this exploration of the bay might shift the focus of the fur trade away from the St. Lawrence River, French Governor Marquis de Argenson refused to grant the Courier de Bois permission to scout the distant territory. Ah, uh, okay. Even though the cost of moving furs over land might have been reduced. Mm. With the independent nature of most Courier de Bois, Radisson and Grossier set out to explore the Upper Great Lakes Basin. A year later, they returned home with top quality furs in such an abundance, the evidence of the potential of the Hudson Bay region could not be denied. However, upon their return, they were taken into custody by the French authorities oh my gosh. and charged with trading without a license. Oh. They were fined and their furs confiscated by the government. With okay, so even back then, like even back in the 1700s, 1800s, it still come down to greed and money, didn't it? Oh my golly gosh, absolutely insane. So this is about the trade wars of beaver fur, I'm guessing. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Oh my golly, golly gosh. And the French not wanting to give up the power and the money that they had or they were making from trading fur. Okay. Without French support, the two men turned to a group of Bostonian businessmen. Okay. These men decided to take the risk and invest to help finance their explorations. Oh, okay. However, the 1663 voyage was stopped dead in its tracks when the ship ran headlong into pack ice in the Hudson Strait. Oh, wow. Undeterred by the failure of the 1663 expedition, 1663. Radisson and Grossier, with the help of Boston-based English commissioner, Colonel George Cartwright, went on a fundraising campaign throughout England to fund the men's exploration. They arrived in London in 1665, amid the Great Plague, otherwise known as the Black Death. Yeah. They would eventually receive the sponsorship of Prince Rupert, it was the prince who introduced them to his cousin, King Charles II of England. In 1668, they set out with two ships, the Nonsuch and Eaglet. The two ships sailed out of Deptford, England, but the Eaglet, beset with problems, was forced oh. to turn back to the British Isles. The Nonsuch continued on to James Bay, a small southern portion of Hudson Bay. Yeah. It was there that they founded the first fort on Hudson Bay, Charles Fort, in okay. 1668. What began as a disobedient act would evolve into the largest land acquisition in North America and a company that would span the test of time. Wow, there you go. Join us as we explore the history of the Hudson's Bay Company. Wow, I'm loving this so far. The Hudson Bay Company. Join us and let's learn about the history of the Hudson Bay Company. Like I said at the start, it all just come down to money, wealth and greed, didn't it? Even back in the 16, 17, 1800s. Oh my gosh. Absolutely crazy to think about it. Man, they went all the way from Canada to London in the 1600s to try and secure finance to go out on their own. How long does it take them to get there? And then you've got the icebergs and stuff like that. The Titanic didn't even make it and they left from London to New York, mate. Oh my gosh. You don't think about things like that. You don't think about 
how far people would travel like hundreds of hundreds of years ago to get what they wanted to to go for what they wanted and things like that this is really really interesting stuff we're learning about the core of some really important history that made the foundation of canada let's keep on going this is really cool stuff on may 2nd 1670 with a royal charter from king charles the second of england the governor and company of adventurers of england trading into hudson bay was incorporated okay the charter granted the company a monopoly over the region drained by all rivers and streams flowing into hudson bay in northern canada for a while the region was called rupert's land named for the first governor of the company appointed by the king this drainage basin constitutes 1.5 million square miles. Holy moly, that's, that's roughly a Roughly over one-third yeah. of the area of yeah. present-day Canada. Wow. The land even dipped down into a portion of what would become the United States of America. Oh, look, look there's the line the there. The Hudson Bay Company became the largest landowner in all of North America. Wow. The HBC established six posts between 1668 and 1717. Three were on James Bay, Rupert House in the southeast, Moose Factory in the south, <sighs> Fort Albany, Ontario in the west. I've heard of Fort the Albany. The other three, Fort Severn, York Factory, and Fort Churchill, were established on the western shore of Hudson Bay. Wow. No inland posts were built until after 1774. With convenient access to the interior waterway system, mm. York Factory became the main post. They were called factories because a factor, a person acting as a mercantile agent, did business from the posts. With the HBC ensuring consistent pricing throughout the region, a means of exchange became based on the MB, a made beaver, which is a prime pelt worn for a year and ready for processing. What? The value of all goods was set by the MB. In other words, prime pelts, or MBs, were the main standard for currency in the Hudson Bay region. Wow! Hold on. So that means beaver fur was actually a currency. Oh my gosh, you wouldn't even think about that. Is that right? Am I hearing that right? I think I am. So beaver fur was considered to be a currency way, way, way when all this was happening. That's insane. Hudson Bay, it is big, isn't it? It is really, really big. And how it all become to be the Hudson Bay Company, we're all learning about it. We're learning about piece by piece how it all come together did they say king charles the second so the king charles that we have now is king charles the <laughs> third mate i had no idea i thought he was just old king charles he's king charles the third well i've learned something new about our present day king there you go had no idea <laughs> native american men and european trappers spent the fall and winter trapping animals and preparing the pelts. They traveled by canoe and on foot to the forts to sell their products. Yeah. Money had no real value in this wild frontier. No. Just These trappers bartered for goods such as knives, kettles, beads, needles, and the now famous Hudson's Bay Point Blanket. Each year when the native traders of the region arrived at the posts, yeah. the atmosphere turned extremely festive, oh, okay. almost to the point of being a formal ritual. In its early days, the prices at these trade meetings varied from post to post. This coveted fur trading business, along with its posts, became the object of contention yes. between the English and the French. Oh, no. The French cultivated a network of Native American allies in their fur trade business. And these were often pitted against other Native tribes allied with the English. Oh. This would evolve 
into the French and Indian War. Yes, this is why. With an English victory, the Hudson's Bay Company was free to resume operations and expand deeper into the wilderness. Yeah. By 1774, they established their first inland trading post in Cumberland House, Saskatchewan. Okay. Today, the Hudson's Bay Company has evolved from trading post to department stores. Retail shops were established where posts had once been. Okay. Today, the department store business is the only remaining part of the company's operations that continues under the Hudson's Bay brand. Oh, hello. It has diversed into joint ventures, credit cards, mortgages, personal insurance, petroleum, meat shops, books, restaurants, car rentals, Holy moly. Cineplex Theaters, Lord & Taylor, and more are all now under the original corporation of the Hudson's Bay Company. Wow! A full two-thirds of the needs of all Canadians are met by the Hudson's Bay Company. Holy moly! Hold on. Mate, I want to know more. Is the Hudson's Bay Company owned by Canadians? Is it on the stock exchange? I want to know more about the present day Hudson Bay Company, not just the history of the Hudson Bay Company. So guys, if you have any suggestions, please join my Discord, throw them up on Discord. I want to learn more about present day Hudson Bay Company. Mate, to me, it sounds like Woolworths. Woolworths in Australia is huge. It owns supermarkets, petrol stations, does, you know, sells insurance, all that sort of stuff owns pubs and restaurants and places like that, laundromats, more and more and more. But yeah, so it sounds like it's very similar to Woolworths. So guys, in the comments, share some suggestions of videos that I should look into to learn more about present day Hudson Bay Company. Okay, that was the video for today, guys. I liked it. I love stepping back and learning about past history of Canada. If you like the video, please jump on, smash the like button, leave a comment, and of course, remember to subscribe. That really helps me out. Cheers for that under. Take care. Bye.